Well, good evening, Brian, and welcome along to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, number 337, and our 98th lockdown lecture series. Uh, nearly at the end of this lecture series, Brian, we have only two meetings to go until the 101st meeting uh, a week on uh, two weeks this evening. And by then, I think we will be back to uh, the normality of Freemasonry that we, we all enjoy. Uh, Brian, can I remind you of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidelines for our Zoom meetings? Please, at all times, keep your video running. If you do have bandwidth challenges, Brian, just drop me a little message in the chat. Thank you. Can I also invite you to sign our virtual tile on our Facebook pages? Uh, that ensures that we've got a record of everyone who has attended and joined us over the last 98 weeks. <coughs> at this time, Brian, can I, I thank everyone who joined us for our marathon session on Saturday afternoon when we hosted our second annual Masonic Esoterica Symposium. Brian, we, we were fortunate to have Brian from Australia uh, through uh, coming leftward around the map, uh, through India, South Africa, throughout Europe, and through to North and South America. And it was a fantastic afternoon. So those of you who stayed with us for the, the four hours, 40 minutes, thank you so much for, for your time and your dedication. Uh, that is now available all four and a half hours on our YouTube channel, Brian, and it gives you the opportunity to dip in and dip out. Uh, the, 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 all the speakers were fantastic, but the opening address by Brother Stuart Cleland was really special for us here at the Lodge Hope of Karachi because he introduced the esotericism of Sir Richard Francis Burton. Uh, many of you will recognise him as the, the author or the translator and the, of A Thousand and One Arabian Nights. Others of you might uh, recognise him as the, the translator of the Karma Sutra. Uh, I'll leave it to you, Brian, to decide which book you've read in the past. But he was a member of the Lodge Hope of Karachi, Brian, uh, back in the days when we met in Sindh in India. But less to do with that. But this evening, Brian, uh, I'm delighted to welcome another guest from uh, across the pond. And uh, it's a great delight to welcome Brother Frank Bell. Uh, to, to join us this evening. Uh, a little bit about uh, Brother Bell. He worked in the family construction firm until 1996 when he moved from New Jersey to Florida. So he's down in the sun, Shine State, and he's still there this evening speaking to us. Uh, he was entered, passed, and raised in St. Alban Lodge, number 529, meeting in Philadelphia in 2000, uh, followed by his membership a number of years later in the University Lodge, number 51, meeting in Philadelphia. And he was elected a uh, worshipful master in 2011. The lodge uh, won the Grand Master's Award for its operations. Uh, Brother Bell completed the Academy and Masonic Knowledge Program under the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania and was awarded the Masonic Scholar Award. Uh, following this, he had a paper, True Believers, Freemasonry in the Eyes of Simon Bolivar, published through the Hibiscus Review of Freemasonry and the Pietra Stones Review of Freemasonry. And I will share that paper <laughs> later on this evening on the uh, Facebook page, Brian. Uh, Brother Frank is also a member of the York Bright Bodies uh, and uh, a founder and PS of Ouroboros Chapter AMD and one time member of the Royal Order of Scotland. And through his work with different lodges, mostly focusing on lodge rejuvenation and retention, he was made an honorary member of St Alban Lodge number 35 of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Philadelphia and Lodgia Luth de America uh, 255 of the Grand Lodge of Florida. With that introduction, Brother Bell, the virtual floor is over to you to uh, give us your presentation on those Masonic figures uh, that were around uh, in South America. Brother Bell. Okay. Now I was muted there for a second. Good evening, brethren. How are you all this evening? Uh, I tend to scream because I can't, I don't have earphones. So what can I tell you? Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, as I was uh, mentioning earlier to Brother Gordon, uh, this is an older paper that was done uh, as part of a program that we were doing at the Grand Lodge, which was an Academy of Masonic Knowledge, basically to try to get the membership more interested in Masonic history and doing their own research and things of that nature. Uh, at that time, I had been working down here in Florida and had um, the good fortune to be involved with uh, some people in, in Doric Lodge, which meets uh, outside of Fort Lauderdale. A number of those fellows were from Columbia. 
and uh, explain, they explained the whole dynamic of South American Freemasonry as far as how it differed from what we had in the United States. Uh, that brought me into dealing with Luz de America in, in Miami, which is, a, is the only or was the only lodge working in the language of Spanish in the Grand Lodge of Florida jurisdiction. There was one other one, but Luz de America is the original which is on its own would create, as you can imagine, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, problems, trials, tribulations to translate the work to Spanish to make it correct, to then learn it in Spanish and then to uh, dictate it from that fashion. But um, it, it, it worked and uh, you know, uh, we had been dealing with people off and on from down in there, I'd been down in South America. In fact, I have to go down uh, on the 15th for the uh, Grand Lodge of Columbia's 100th anniversary. So that's gonna be a, it's gonna be a big party for four or five days, but they also bring a lot of educational speakers. Um, and it all came together around that time as uh, I told Brother Gordon, we had had the, the International Conference of the History of Freemasonry at Alexandria, which was sponsored by Grand Lodge of Scotland, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong. And, uh, the wide focus of speakers that was out there, uh, more so than just Masonic scholars, it was sociologists, historians, things of that nature. Uh, they, at that time, they had a number of people speaking about uh, Freemasonry as it was brought into the Middle East, especially in Syria. And um, as we were at dinner, uh, one of these other people who was a quote unquote scholar, he was actually working for the Rand Corporation. And they had sent him over there because there ended up being some hubbub in Syria a few years later. And they were looking at how defunct or how uh, available the Masonic system, which was put together by the English in Syria was, and was it still in operation? So that was just a fun fact. I'll throw it as your conspiracy for the day, right? Masonic conspiracy for the day is they were gonna use them when they were gonna move into top of Syria. Um, for me, it's been very hard. My Spanish has gone down every year since I learned it. I, I'm not fluent at all anymore. This, this paper is uh, rather old, but certain characters stood out, even in Philadelphia, where I was originally. If you were at the art, near the art museum, no, I'm sorry, the Academy of Natural Sciences, there's a big statue that looks like George Washington, and it's not. It's Francisco de Miranda. It was paid for by the government of Venezuela and sent up there. You go to New York, there are statues of Simon Bolivar in various places or Bolivar squares and things like that. There were more Venezuelans in the New York area. This was pre-communism. This stuff came up like in the 60s. So there's always the Simon Bolivar, Simon Bolivar, Francisco de Miranda, not so much because, you know, he is a precursor character. And uh, I have included the link to the paper as it exists in, in Pietra Stones. There's a lot of information in there for you to enjoy, hopefully. I just sent uh, Brother Gordon uh, a link yesterday that just came up as I was going back through this. And there is a lot of dynamics that you will see among these characters. Those are the two that I, I, I focus on because they're the most important, even to this day in South America. And as far as that, I mean, Spanish speaking South America. You're talking um, a liberated area. Where would it be? By the time Bolivar has done his war to drive the Spanish out of South America, he frees up what would now be the countries of Bolivia, Colombia, Panama, Ecuador, and Peru, as you know, as well as the Venezuelan area. They used to be called Gran Colombia. So quite an quite an impressive thing to do with very little modern weaponry at the time, uh, very little financial support. In fact, I believe you'll find a, a later battle because we're not gonna cover the battles and stuff. Uh, Lake Carabobo was one of the last battles that were fought by men on horseback with lances. He had what were called the Llaneros, which is like a, uh, like a, a plains cowboy type thing. They were like the wild men. So they had bamboo uh, javelins or lances, as you'd say, and they would go around, stab you up with those things. So the Spanish were the modern war, you know, they were the modern military at the time versus these guys with the Jaguar caps and the uh, long sharp sticks. Uh, most of the stuff that we have that we have dealt with would be along the military issues. 
Uh, Bolivar himself has become kind of this mystical figure because he's used one day by capitalists, one day by communists. You know, as you know, the Bolivarian Republic, as they call it, uh, down in Venezuela. Whereas we have the Bolivarian campus at uh, Winsac at Fort Benning, which is the school of the America. So everybody gets their little whack at Simon Bolivar. Uh, the reason this all comes about, and I'm sure you, a lot of you know, is uh, the colonization style that was done in uh, Spanish South America is greatly different than what would have occurred in an English colony. Uh, the Spanish dealt mostly under the extraction method, which is you enslave as many people as you can get your hands on, dig up the gold, dig up the silver, cut down the trees, whatever, ship it all back to Spain. The American colonies that I'm from, we, <laughs> we didn't do it quite that way. The English had a different system of how they operated. Under the Spanish uh, yoke, there were no big schools built. There were no printing presses. Information was limited. You didn't need to learn things. But as they grew this middle, I would say a middle class, upper middle class, the Criollo class, which is a mixed blood groups, it became important to these people to be more Spanish than the Spanish. If you've ever been at a, at like um, the English club in a foreign country, there used to be those things. They were usually a little more British than the British, as we would say, you know, very, very formalized on that stuff. They um, would send the wealthy children to Spain for education a lot of times. If you were somebody similar to Bolivar, they actually brought a tutor from Europe to him. And this fellow was, and it comes up over and over again, was a uh, direct fan of Rousseau. And he believed that children should be taught in a Rousseauian, Rousseauian philosophy style, which is you're experiencing things in the world with very little oversight. And that's how Bolivar comes about. It's from a very wealthy family and uh, they have silver mines. This all goes away during the war, but I'm just, I'm getting ahead of the story on it. So you have these colonies, we have this issue with education, we have this issue with people being second-class citizens to the Spanish. You know, the, I'm sure you've seen the Spanish blood system, the doubloons, the quatroons, the octoons and all that, the amount of Spanish blood they had versus whatever African or Indian or what have you. They keep records of all this. So there is always this growing wealthier class, not super wealthy, but growing class that is not in the mines, that is not really working, that is not really Spanish, but is supposedly Spanish, if you understand where I'm going from that. And so you have like this identity crisis going on in these people. Now, they do get the chance, like I said, to come to Europe for education or have some tutors. If you were to go to uh, the Catholic Church, of course, the education is being done. But once again, most of that is being handled outside of the country. The, the heads of the, I guess we'll say the archdiocese, are going to be brought over from Spain. All the administrators are brought over from Spain. There's not a lot of native talent that is in the higher levels of the government. And it starts to chafe on these people. Okay, so am I, am I making any sense? I can't sit here. I'm, I'm not used to the Zooms, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're fine, fine. Okay, so <clears throat> this, is, this is bubbling under the surface. And as, as I'm sure any of you other historians know, Spain's not the greatest country to be subjugated by. They just aren't. These people, like I said, are having a series of smaller revolts. They get to a point, let's say, um, there are three significant revolts. The first significant revolt occurs in Gran Colombia. And I believe if you see, I have documentation uh, in the paper you can look at, which involves uh, Bolivar's older brother, who's only mentioned a couple times in history, but there, there is one. And we have uh, a situation where he actually shows up in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, there, that'll be in there. You can read for yourself. It's uh, dealing with a merchant prince that we had. His name was Stephen Gerard, who at one time was the second wealthiest man in the United States. It was Astor's and then Gerard. 
uh, Gerard takes it upon himself to uh, to help out uh, the older Bolivar on his uh, purchase of uh, various weapons and supplies for war and uh, get him straightened out. And then goes the next step, which is to go to the president of the United States at the time and ask them to support the revolutionaries in South America against the Spanish, which is not done because as you know, we had had the Spanish and French as allies against the British, and it was still fresh in some people's minds. And they didn't want to take on the Spanish empire at that point. So that fails. Uh, there was a couple of interesting points of it, which one of it was there was an earthquake during the uh, actual revolt period. And a priest came out and said, see, you've revolted and God has done this. He's, he's, he's collapsing the city. And that busted the whole thing right up. So that was number that was number one. I have the dates on there. Uh, you'll see it in the timeline. Uh, the second one involves this fellow here, Francisco de Miranda. He alone has, if you can, if you have somebody who, if, if you had the money to spend to get a translator, his own documents are just, he wrote constantly, he was a true Renaissance man. He fought for the Americans under Washington. He fought for the Russians, he fought for the French. He was a gentleman, a gentleman soldier, I guess you would say. They said he was the lover of Catherine the Great. You know, he had all these really great stories going on, traveled around the world, I guess, on somebody else's time with a, an elaborate library and, 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 you know, really was that guy. If you wanted to say that's the kind of guy that I think the Enlightenment would be, at that time, Miranda was one of those characters. He ends up in, um, after he's been involved in all these other wars, he ends up in Cadiz, Spain, which is where we run into his contact with these other revolutionaries. De Miranda has no interest in going back to South America and starting a revolution at this point. He's an older guy. He likes to party. He likes the women. You know, he has that cachet going. But he has, you know, he is the man that people say, you know, now Juan Carlos, when you get to Spain, you see, you know, you go and, and see Senor de Miranda and he will, he will, you know, introduce you around. Most of the people who would come at that time, if you see the documents, uh, Bolivar came up, basically they spent most of their money drinking, chasing girls and getting into trouble because that's what most guys do when they're a multimillionaire and let loose in Europe first time right so he does acquire a, a more intimate tie with Miranda uh, for people who don't see these too often and this is I guess this was you Gordon that was the military lodge person who one of you was one of you was uh doing something about military lodge yeah we've been doing quite a bit on that yeah well the the thought is that because we don't know where Miranda gets uh, made a mason. It may be in some other document, but we don't have it. A lot of people like to think it was when he was working under George Washington, because General Washington was like the biggest mason that we ever had at the time. Even though he didn't really do a lot of, you know, he wasn't really a, he wasn't really a, a rich, you know, there was no real ritual thing he was involved in, but he would show up a lot. He liked to use the, uh, the Masonic Lodge during the war as an extra security feature. Most of his officers, you'll find out, would, were Masons. And he had what they would call, we would call, they get a traveling patent for the military lodges. I don't know what they call them in England or Scotland. So the Grand Lodge would issue this traveling patent that allowed you to meet anywhere, because otherwise we are trapped meeting in, in a certain location on the third whatever of every month forever. Uh, I was involved in the Lodge, uh, Lodge 19, Montgomery Lodge, which was a Continental Artillery Battery. So when we had the anniversary of Valley Forge one year, they used their warrant to go hold a table lodge near the Valley Forge National Park. So that was a pretty cool thing. Unfortunately, they, they've since gone south. South Americans don't have it. They're using what they would call like a salon. They're still calling it a lodge, but it would be more of a salon situation, which is a lot of the things you see in this enlightenment period. 
The Germans are using those. I don't know uh, if you know like Gottwald Lessing, German philosopher who writes the Ernst und Falk, the Masonic Discourses. I think they believe he went to one lodge meeting his entire life. He was made and then he just, he just kept on going, right? Totally, you know, very avid, but he did not maintain that once a month on the third. I think we inherited that from the British, that it was that very, that very uh, stock meeting time and, this, and things like that. So they opened up, uh, I think it's uh, Lohia Lotura, which at these meetings, other than what we would consider Masonic work, uh, they're having discussions on geometry and philosophy and things like that, the real you know, liberal arts kind of discussions. But they would consider that you know, working because I don't, I don't know if we're tiled here or what, but you, you know what I mean? There's the requirements to learn the liberal arts that we use. And um, so they're basically working that part of their work. And the, you know, it's making a big impression on these guys at the same time, uh, even though uh, Bolivar comes from this Rousseauan, you know, man in the wild kind of uh, formation, Voltaire is everywhere. You know, if you're on the continent and you don't know Voltaire at that time, you don't know the workings then you're not considered culture. So he strikes this, this uh, juxtaposition through Miranda. And that's why I sent you that other link. You, we, as you read these different articles, and, and like I said, this one that I have isn't as, depth, as deep because I'm just doing a little more work on this. That whole Rousseau versus Voltaire uh, situation is seen in Miranda and in Bolivar. Miranda is Voltaire. Bolivar is Rousseau. You know, I, he clings to certain ideas. He, he admires, you know, most things about Miranda, but he has his own, you know, Bolivar has many shortcomings, <laughs> which they, they know over the years. One of which unfortunately is not stopping fighting the Spanish because he continues to do that for quite some time. Um, We have, like I said, this is this is how this is going on. The logic hadith, which we have, uh, that he is raised in. Once again, I have the information you can find on the site that has Bolivar's Masonic history as we know it. This was from a, a different scholar who really went down and looked at it. Some of them are going to be questionable. Obviously, it's like uh, Ben Franklin in in Paris. He couldn't possibly have formed all those lodges, you know, when he was there as an, an ambassador. Everybody in their in their grandmothers, they would say, had a lodge had Ben Franklin as the uh, as one of the founders of it. But the Cadiz Lodge is actually founded by British merchants, so it's not working under the Grand Lodge of Spain. It just happens to be there, and they meet. And I said, well, that's that's odd. But as I said, I didn't know very much about it at the time. There, I included, the, you see the image in there, uh, the schooner picture. There's a picture of a schooner that you'll see in this, uh, in the series that I gave you. That's is actually, I guess you would say a contemporary drawing. So that meant that if I'm flying a Masonic flag at the top of my mast as I come in, that means there are Masons on the ship that wish to have a meeting. So they use that as a chance to Come into town, you know, as you're coming into port, you tie up. Somebody either met or they knew that they were coming to meet. They'd have a little impromptu Masonic gathering. I give you the news of the world. You give me the news of the port, such as that, okay? So I'm assuming that the Cadiz Lodge was something similar to that. It was like a, like Mariner's Lodge, if you have one of those. It's always a Mariner's Lodge somewhere. But under that, they were actually making masons in Spain, which would have been a big no-no at the time, knowing how the Catholic Church was about the whole Masonic thing and Protestants in general, still in the 1700s. And uh, so he's made there, they give him a few other degrees. He has Scottish right, uh, York right, some New York right. He doesn't have um, Royal Arch, which I thought was strange, but then uh, I'd read the Dunkerley book on, on Royal Arch. I don't know how involved Scotland is in Royal Arch degrees. 
yes or no? That that was yeah, a whole, you know. Involved, Frank. Yeah, we we sort of lumped a number of those degrees together in the United States that you probably wouldn't have, like Royal Arc Mariner. We don't really do that. It's just you're allowed to, to say that you are um, you're able to have it conferred upon you if such a time were to come. Whereas I know Royal Arc Mariner was pretty big with in, in the United Kingdom. So once again, there's probably some attributed ones. The year that he's raised is probably accurate because it's still two degree system. It's not three. Which was that was a good sign for me because not everybody, you know, if you were just making stuff up and you hear there's three degrees, knowing that we used to have the two made it sound a little more legitimate. So these guys, him, Santander, Sucre, over a period of time have this interaction with Miranda. They go back home, they get involved with revolutionary types in their own countries or under Grand Colombia, let's say. It's decided they want Miranda to come back and lead this revolt because he's, you know, he's the most famous person coming out of South America, I guess you could say, in quite some time. I'm greatly oversimplifying it for you because we're trying to knock this out in a few minutes. And uh, the revolt fails. Like I said, Miranda doesn't want to be involved in it anyway. He's perfectly happy, like I said, if you were an older man, you know, how old did you really live in the 1700s, right? He has wealthy girlfriends. He has drinks. He can play with his geometry sets. He's got everything done. He goes there, sort of forced into it. There's the Spanish catch up with them, crush the thing, and they ask for Miranda. Bolivar, to justify what he has to do, makes it like somehow... Miranda did something wrong and Bolivar is the one who hands Miranda over to the Spanish. Here's his, you know, <clears throat> here's you, here you are, you're his biggest fan, right? Until the first day things don't go right. <laughs> and there you are. Okay, you know, they turn him over to uh, the Spanish who then deal with him later on. That allows them to live because as you, you know, at the time, there was not a lot of negotiating with terrorists back then. Everybody got killed or everybody got sent to the mines or what have you. So Miranda goes off into the sunset. Bolivar has to rethink his life. As you know, there, it begins his odyssey, he ends up in Jamaica, things of that nature, then comes back finally and he's, uh, after the death of the wife, he is married, he's theoretically in love, who knows? She dies, this all goes south. And now he's back on this, we're gonna free, you know, I can imagine everyone after a bad breakup doesn't say I'm gonna free South America from the Spanish. But here was the one guy who, who decided that would be the thing to do to get the girl off his mind, right? Usually you have a couple of drinks or you scream or curse or cry, right? No. This begins the successful conquest, we could almost say, of Grand Colombia by Bolivar and a number of these lieutenants of his, all of which goes back to this idea of human, it, it's beyond a regular human rights, it's a God-given right. Why aren't, we, why aren't we equal to the Spanish, right? Why are we living in servitude? Even though they weren't living in servitude, servitude, some of them, they do this. Now, what he did learn, and this brings back uh, 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 thoughts to similar, I guess, to Napoleonic France was the whole equality thing. The other two times that they had revolutions, both failed because they decided not to free the Africans. Bolivar, says, we're not gonna do that, everybody's equal. So, and I need soldiers. So everybody's equal. He marries his cousin's daughter to a black guy, which is not particularly done at the time, but it is when you're the liberator. So he says, I'll show you how equal I am. I'll have one of my family members marry somebody from African descent. They vanish from history, just like everybody else. Uh, from there on, like I said, it's years 
years of just slogging through the jungles and mountains dealing with the Spanish. He does, on the other hand, have still this ideal, which is the, um, the enlightenment dream, you know, of a, like a, the Plato's Republic type thing. We can have this and, we can, you know, just by making people free, they will immediately wish to pursue knowledge and everything will be a lovely place. As he moves along, as you can imagine what happens, happens, that's just not what occurs. His, his generals that he leaves in control of various key parts of the world decide that they're now their areas. And he, you know, just goes from conquest to conquest, eventually ending up kind of despised by the people that used to love him less than 10 years ago. So that's his thing. And, you know, there, he has many, many famous things in that. But the, I, I, greatly oversimplify the fact that the drivers for this, at that time, when you see various documents, is Freemasonry and the Enlightenment entwined to where it's almost the same thing to some of these people. And we look at it totally differently, I guess, at this point. We don't see it as that. It's, it's you know, it's a story out of information it makes better, good men better or whatever cliche line we're using but blessing documents uh ernst and falk of course he has that in there he has the fact that they consider in europe at the time of the american revolution that they're fighting to restore that type of ideal republic later on i believe some people sort of cloak napoleon with that depending on who you talk to not so much that he is a mason but he is his, his republic will be this dynamic, earth-changing thing for the good. Bolivar and these younger fellows all go down this same route. Miranda, who, who was just, I, I, you don't want to sound so down, but you know he sort of knew that it's good to improve yourself, but if we're going to use this as our, as our banner, we're going in to free a bunch of people who are basically slaves who have no literary anything, who have no, any background in any of the things you're talking about. And that's, that's what he'll, he'll portray in some of the writings if you've seen uh, the collected works of, uh, of Bolivar is he, he's very wordy as they, as they are at the time. You know, it's, um, I, I guess it was a, a thing at that time period and I've seen it with some people that are classically educated they throw a lot of references to like, I'll throw in a, a quote from ancient Greek and I, you should know it because I know it. You know, we both are, had greats, you know, we both went to Oxford or Cambridge together and you know, you, you know that line, then you should know the other ones. That came in a lot of the times in his type of work, but then as he's sitting there with people who were basically in chains up until 20 minutes before he got there, he can't get this, he cannot get his government together. He cannot make this ideal situation out of what is the, the current and true situation. So like I said, it's a lot of like, it, it's, it's very cerebral on a lot of levels and I guess I'm just not doing it justice. But that, that's a real, this is the old revolutionary. This isn't the Che Guevara, Black Beret and freaking guys. They actually think that they're going to form this new utopian society to some extent based on knowledge and, and, and uh, learning in these places. And all they have to do is cast off the evil Spanish in an oppressive church and they should do it. Then they realize there's a lot more nuts and bolts to keep in the electric off. <laughs> so that's why that, that a lot of people would say Boulevard continues to conquer because it's very hard to rule. It's easy to just keep pushing the Spanish into the sea because you don't have to go back and make sure that somebody's, you know, cleaning the streets and keeping the cows in or whatever. The cheetahs aren't eating everybody's babies, whatever's going on. So that's that's kind of where we stand with that. Uh, normally, like I said, this serves me because normally we do questions and stuff as we go along and it's easier for me to expound on it. I know it's probably been a little in and out and left and right, but if you uh, 
No, you want to do that? Yeah, thank, thank you so much for that. It, it gives us a, a really good uh, introduction uh, to those uh, Los Liberators uh, down in South America. Uh, and I, I, we will share the papers on our Facebook page later on. Uh, there are a couple of questions in there. Uh, we, we do have a brother with us from uh, Chile, or he lives in Chile, uh, and he's got a, a little bit of knowledge. He, he, he's, a, he's a Brit uh, expat over there. And uh, he, uh, Aubrey asks, have you heard of uh, O'Higgins, San Martin? Uh, oh, the, the liberators of, Yeah. With, with them, with this particular group, the, the Miranda, Bolivar, Santander, Sucre group is going to be a different type of situation. They all orbited and actually interacted with each other. Bolivar interacts with other people on his own, or Santander or Sucre uh, interact with people on their own. Bernardo O'Higgins, he could have a whole thing to himself. I thought we'd have something about Cochrane, you know, the Seawolf. He also has a, a, a great place in that. They aren't exposed as much in these documents because the people that I had to get these from were concentrating more on uh, these two people, Miranda and uh, Bolivar. But O'Higgins, uh, like I said, you could do a good hour or two on him. Cochran, as you know, is, uh, he ends up being the the uh, Lucky Jack and Master and Commander. If you see that, that a lot of that is uh, Cochrane's uh, exploits when he's with the British Navy and then he becomes a mercenary for the Spanish Revolution. You know, his whole thing was, if you don't pay me, I'm just gonna invade a town and take the money from wherever it is anyway. So if he was owed $20,000, he would roll up on the next port and plunder them and get his twenty thousand dollars. And he says, "What's well, the revolutionary government's problem for not paying?" Yeah, fantastic news. If I may uh, join in here, um, fantastic to hear that. But unfortunately, Mr. Cochrane was not a Mason. He had nothing to do with Freemasonry. That's what my I said. We, that's comment, why we my, I continue with the comment, if I may, that uh, Gordon started. Has Brother Bell heard of Argentina, Peru, Chile, O'Higgins? San Marcin, etc. There are other countries and Mason liberators in and of South America, apart from Bolivar. Cochran yes. was not one, he was not a Mason. Your I, I, lecture was supposed to be, I believe, about the, the freedom, people who freed up the colonies during the colonial time in South America. You concentrated solely on North America. So, uh, I, 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 I'm, to be honest, I'm rather disappointed. Well, I wasn't saying that Cochran was a Mason. I said that he was has an interesting story, as does O'Higgins have an interesting story. Yeah, and I, I think, Audrey, it, it was advertised as uh, where, where Frank was coming to uh, a couple of the ones, uh, and particularly, is focused on uh, De Miranda and Bolivar, and I think we've had other uh, lockdown lectures it's, on says those it subjects. Somewhere. Yeah, <clears throat> but I, I think uh, I, Frank, yeah. I'd like to ask you about. It's what, in the title. It's yeah. in the title. What do we know about the, the, their actual Masonic involvement? We know they were Freemasons, but is is there any knowledge about how? how often they attended, were the regulars, or were they just Freemasons in name, per se? Well, that's that's what I, I was saying, is the the lodge that we're discussing, and uh, I, I'll pull this up since, just so we know, this is Simon Bolivar. This is not all these other guys. He was entered 1804 to 1805 in Cadiz. He was raised in 1805-1806, once again in Cadiz, which is an English organization. Now, if they had a warrant, they're now uh, Lodge Number 2 in the Grand Lodge of Spain, I think. Now, he had been given other Masonic credits, which is uh, in Venezuela. There is one. And uh, in Peru, Order and Liberty Lodge Number 2 in Peru. They have him down as a founder, but as I said, you can't be sure of that because there are no written documents. 
a lot of this is a one-off. You were raised, you did it that night, and you went on. You weren't really doing once a month meeting, or you weren't learning ritual or things of that nature. That's where that's why he said they're going to have a different style. But his, this particular guy, not anybody in Argentina or Peru or anything else, Simon Bolivar, if that's, a, if that's lodged, then it's going to be a working similar to something you would have been familiar with because it's either one or two of your different rituals, right? Yeah. So that's what you have with him. But like I said, they have him down for a Scottish rite and Knight Templar, things of that nature. Then they, they put it up to 32, but at that time they weren't doing that rush to 32 that you see today, like in the United States. They just, if you join Scottish Rite, you're at 32 by the time the, the meeting's over. Other South America, where we, not everywhere in South America, I have to put it that way. You are working for years, you know, you're doing reports, you're giving presentations, things like that. So, that's what you have on them. But the actual working as far as Miranda's having his operation, his would be an informal lodge situation because he is not able to confer degrees since he doesn't have a warrant. That's why they end up with the Cadiz Lodge. Okay, no. <clears throat> and uh, I, th I think the other name, uh, that the, the, the two names that interest me uh, that you mentioned, uh, Rousseau, uh, and Gerard, uh, the, the second wealthiest man in the US. Uh, was Gerard a Mason? Do you know? Stephen Gerard was a Mason. He was raised in uh, South Carolina, but he spent his uh, entire Masonic career in Philadelphia. He couldn't join uh, in Pennsylvania because he had a malformation over his one eye. And under the uh, strictures of the degrees in Pennsylvania, you had to be full in all of your limbs and body parts. Okay. So he went to South Carolina, which was actually founded by Pennsylvania, but that's how he did it. He was in Mariner Lodge in South Carolina to be raised. And then he spent the rest of his time at two or three different lodges in Center City, Philadelphia. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> you, you talked a lot about Rousseau. Uh, was he a, a Mason? That, no. They always used to They check both of them. I don't believe you're going to find that to be the case because he was more of an anti-establishment type. Whereas I think you could see, and, and we have to, once again, nobody really checks like Voltaire so much, but he was so prominent at the time. And he would be in the salons in general. Yeah. If you had a salon, so it'd be more of an informal type of situation where you're still talking philosophy or mathematics, sciences, things of that nature. I mean, there used to, there was a, for a long time, everybody was, you know, everybody was amazing. And then people went back and looked at it to see that that wasn't true. Uh, just as uh, your other brother mentioned, Cochrane was not. But then again, I don't think, you know, we never said that he was. We just mentioned he was uh, a, a big character in uh, a, not a sea of big characters, but there was a number of big people at that time. Uh, you know, I, I can't pull up anything out of my hat on all those other countries. But like I said, we, we were dealing mostly with the Grand Columbia area. Yeah, no, no, thank Frank. Thank you so much. And on behalf of everyone here at the Lockdown Lecture, can I thank you for uh, pulling this uh, presentation together for us? And uh, I will share your full papers on our Facebook pages later on this evening for the, the rest of the realm. Uh, and it's been a, a great a delight to have you join us here as our 98th uh, speaker uh, in our Lockdown Lecture Series. So thank you so much, uh, Brother Frank Bell. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Vern, I, just before I, I open up the mics for, for our usual closure, I, next week, I, meeting 100. I, we never ever thought we would get into three figures, Vern, but I, our 100th uh, lockdown lecture will be next week. And it will be, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Brother Ted Cross, who will talk to us about early Christianity, Gnosticism and Freemasonry. And that will be followed up the week later with our final lockdown lecture, uh, meeting 101, uh, which will be done by a, a previous lockdown lecturer, uh, brother Alan Beck, who's known to many of you. Uh, 
And this evening, as uh, the majority of us will know, it's Burns Night. Uh, and to round off the season and to round off the lockdown lecture series, I thought it'd be fitting that we closed with arguably uh, another presentation to follow up from uh, Ian Duell last January and Bob Cooper the previous year on uh, Brother Ravi Burns, uh, probably the, the our most famous uh, Masonic export. Uh, and he's going to tell us the story of Brother Colin Ray Brown, who was the, the creator, or he believes was the creator of the modern day Burns movement. So Brian, two more weekly lockdown lectures to go, number 100 next week and 101 the following week, and then back to some sort of normality. <coughs> that normality will be our installation meeting, uh, Brian, which you're all uh, very much invited to. Uh, the details will be on the Facebook pages and uh, it will be a four o'clock tile on Saturday the 19th of February when Brother Kevin Thompson I will take over the, the reins from me uh, after I've done my four meetings plus uh, 101 uh, over the last two years. So, Brian, uh, please feel free now to unmute and say your thank yous and your good evenings uh, to Brother Frank Bell. Thank you. Well done, Frank. Really enjoyed it. Well done. Thank you. <coughs> Brother well, Frank, that was a very, it. very interesting dance around the subject in a very, very different way. And it, it's nice to look at it from this point of view. It was nice and light. Very well done, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Brother Frank. I enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Frank. I enjoyed that one. Thanks once again. Congratulations. Yes, I want to say I enjoyed it very much as well. If anyone's uh, was stuck. We can hear you, John. Okay. Um, I, I've been to St. Albans Lodge in Pennsylvania. Wow. They, they all went from the, the edges of the lodge room, as we would have it, and they went to the centre. They formed a virtual table, and the candidate came in and was conducted round the table. And when he was tapped on the back of the shoulder, the warden or the master would turn and address the candidate. It was exactly as you can imagine it was when you were in a pub in London or Edinburgh or somewhere else. Uh, they did three thirds and a second all in one night. And then they took me to a, a, an eatery over the road. Fabulous evening. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll give you five, Brian. Brother Frank, thank you very much for the interesting lecture tonight. It was lovely. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Brother Frank. And uh, three, Brian. Thank you very much. Very much, Brother Frank. Very interesting. Right, and two, Brian. And one. Brother Frank Bell, once again, on behalf of the members of the Lodge Hope of Cratchit and all our uh, guests at our Lockdown Lecture Series, thank you so much for coming along this evening and giving us uh, your story of the Liberators uh, Boulevard and <coughs> De Miranda. It's very much appreciated. Thank you, sir. Okay.